Hey, and welcome to Industry Night with me, Nikki Nellis, the show that takes you on a deep dive into the happenings of the hospitality industry. Now, sometimes there's a focus on culture, and sometimes there's a focus on travel trends, and sometimes there's a focus on passion projects, but it all comes back to the industry. Hey, everyone. Guess what? After almost three years, basically since March 9th, 2020, I am no longer doing industry night out of my bedroom. Now, you may remember the days when I used to do industry night out of the line hotel, RIP. Not that the line doesn't exist anymore, just their studio doesn't. Uh, and when the pandemic happened, we moved it into my bedroom where I talked to everybody in the industry about the highs and lows of what they were going through during the pandemic. And here I am hopefully on the other side. And I am incredibly excited to announce a partnership with the Wine Lair. So that's this beautiful space I'm sitting in. Have you heard of the Wine Lair? You may have not, only because this U.S. outpost of the European Wine Bank actually opened up smack dab in the middle of the pandemic, August 2020. I know that for a fact because I came in in September of 2020, I was all messed up and I got a tour of the facility and the facility is really gorgeous. Um, but now I'm going to be doing industry night here. Uh, longtime friend, John Prin, you know him from his 2941 days. And of course he's the former chef and owner of Clarity. Um, well, now he's the CEO of Wine Lair here in DC. Um, and in a sec, we're going to find out more about Wine Lair, what it is, why you don't know about it and what you should know. And then later in the show, and this couldn't have happened more beautifully if I had tried it myself, we are doing caviar. I mean, if there was ever a place to snack on those briny, creamy bubbles of deliciousness, it is here at Wine Lair. So joining me later today will be Sarah Mayo. She is with Black River Caviar, and she has all the info on the who, the what of the caviar industry, because it's a lot. There's a lot to know, and you need to know it before you snack, uh, especially with all the holidays coming up. Okay, so before you warm up those bellinis, let's get into John Crane. Hi, Chef. Do I call you Chef? Are we still a chef? What are we these days? I think at this point, maybe just John. Okay, I'll just call you John. <laughs> Hi, John. How are you? I'm fantastic. Excited for this partnership and to reconnect with you. Mm -hmm. it's been a long time. It has been a long time. Okay, so let's talk about the wine layer. Let's tell people what it is first, and then we can talk about how you got involved with it. So uh, started uh, entertaining different projects at the beginning of this year. Mm -hmm. um, a very good friend, longtime uh, guest of mine, uh, called me and said he had built Wine Lair uh, and opened, like you said, in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, wanted to regain traction coming out of the pandemic. And mm -hmm. with my sort of, I guess, particular set of skills <laughs> with right. uh, culinary and business that mm -hmm. I put together over the years, could I... Um, you know, assist in the reopening and the elevation of the concept. So, and there's no better person I'd rather do it with. Uh, so I said, yes, I'd love to. Okay. So what is the concept? Because my understanding of it is that it's a private wine club. Yeah. So it is a club for members and guests. Mm -hmm. um, and it is a wine and spirit and private restaurant club. Mm. But the way I look at it, and this is what I said from the beginning, was any group of like-minded people that you want to get together, um, what you want to create is experiences. Right? I mean, just like any other business. All you're trying to do is create an experience where someone who can spend their time doing whatever they want, everyone here is so busy, right? right? Then the, the, the project is to create an environment that people want to make part of their journey. Mm -hmm. um, now we have happen to have food, great wine, and great spirits, so that's that's a start. Right. Um, but there's a lot of that around. Uh, well, that's what I was thinking. Right. I mean, to me, when I think of what Wine Lair is, I mean, I love the, the addition of a full food program, a cocktail program, and then you have amazing wines, but people can also keep their wines here. You have lockers. I mean, that's a real departure from what you see in restaurants around town. 
Well, some restaurants do have, have, have had wine lockers for a long time, but here, here's the, what you're trying to do with the differentiator, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a, it is a club for members and guests. Okay. Right? So it's not, it's not public. Um, there, are, there are reasons that people want to be associated with clubs. We know this. There are country clubs, there's sure. this club, that club, chess club, mm -hmm. all these kinds of things. This is a club for uh, eating and drinking, uh, with like-minded people and elevating your education because I have a staff of very skilled wine, spirit, and culinary professionals. Right? Okay. Well, let's talk about them for a second. Like, so did you curate this staff? Was some of them here before you? Like, who did you bring in for the culinary component? Did you bring in for the wine component? How did you go about doing that? So, so some of my, my, my staff, um, some were here, mm -hmm. um, and some I brought in. Um, for example, on, uh, on the uh, uh, wine side and the general management side, there was, you know, uh, Alyssa Pavlova, Rachel Brosno. Um, they they were here. Mm -hmm. um, they've had the WSET level level threes. Um, so they're no dopes. They're no dopes. There's no dopes. There's actually we actually have four WSET level three uh, on staff. Wow. Um, we have a, a comprehensive wine list that we put together to to accentuate and elevate their skills mm -hmm. uh, for members and guests to come in. Um, and let's talk about the, the, the wine lockers. So what you do, you bring in, if, you're, if you love to collect wine, want your wine to be stored in literally the best temperature controlled situation I've ever seen. Okay. Uh, and I've seen a pretty good amount of them. Um, in a, a modern environment that you determine that, you know, social and or business, I want to bring people here. Mm -hmm. The differentiator may be the look, you know, that because it's a club, you're going to, you may want to meet other like-minded people. I have a lot of people that have huge sellers in their homes, but actually saying I do a lot of private dinners for sure. them. And they actually say, I don't have a lot of people that are necessarily like-minded. So just because you collect doesn't mean that all your friends collect. And this is what I found, right? No, no, no. Usually when you collect, you have a lot of friends who want to help you drink your wine. Correct. They want to complete your inventory. <laughs> I mean, right? trust me, I was really good friends with Mark Culler. There was a reason exactly. for that. Other exactly. than the fact that I love him. So family. I've gotten together a lot of people. So that's a, that is one of <laughs> many demographics that we are accumulating. Um, but that is one demographic that you might think wouldn't want to join a club because they have the storage at home, but they actually do want to join a club for multiple reasons, different reasons. So mm -hmm. the storage is one thing, but it's just a facilitator for gathering the people, mm -hmm. right? So it can either be a collector, it can be someone that's, you know, of any age, right? Or maybe you don't collect, but, but you want to start collecting and we can help with that. Mm -hmm. And you want to elevate your education in wine because maybe you're 30 years old, you have a great job, that you have, you know, in DC and you have clients that you want to take out, you want to learn more about wine. And a lot of people with clients around here, they've they've taken them to the restaurants already of the fantastic restaurants right. that are here. But you can't necessarily, unless you get a private room, which doesn't always equate to the amount of people you're bringing, mm -hmm. you may not have a private place to talk about what you want to talk about or gather for either, like I said, business or social for the reasons and and like get a vision from that gathering that you can do here that you can't always do in a restaurant. So just like we talk about why anyone would join a club for anything, mm -hmm. that's what I say. Like the facilities are amazing, but the people and the reasons they want to make it part of their journey is why we're gaining so much traction already. Come well, on. I mean, that makes sense. Plus I imagine people uh, who, a, are really into wine and spirits, mm -hmm. um, and those who are looking to business meetings or impress people, um, walking into a place where, remember, you're going to expect a certain amount of hospitality, right? So and you're customized going to, hospitality. Right. Like, you're going to be treated a certain way. Your guests will be treated a certain way. I mean, that's that's what people are paying I'm for. I'm going to say this is, this is there's, there's nothing that I can say that you don't, already know mm -hmm. we can all figure out right but this physical space at this level mm -hmm. hasn't really existed in dc for a while no yeah this really is unique now 
my very good friend who built it, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's funny because I know him, he's thinking like, I love wine, I want a club, right. I'm building. <laughs> but if you dig into the, especially we're here in West End, which is a really up and coming neighborhood, I mean, the, you know. I think it was already up and coming. It's sort of like a sleeper neighborhood. I don't think people think of the West End because there's not a lot of hotness happening. Do you know what I mean? But it's an amazing residential community with, I mean, you're right on the edge of the really beginning of both Georgetown and you know, the city, you know. Something is vibing, mm-hmm. um, right, and not out of coming. It's always right. been around, right. and something's happening. Just like something's happening in Lower Georgetown, mm-hmm. you're seeing more restaurants come up. And yeah, so this is just sort of, there seems to be a momentum here. I see different um, demographics of people walking around here that I didn't used to see, okay. um, which just means it, it just seems to be going in the right direction. Mm-hmm. Um, so, the, you know, another part of the, uh, of a club is that, you know, we can, you know, curate stuff that uh, you can't get if you're not a member. Right. Uh, or, yeah, so that's, if you if you gather all those situations up and you create an environment where it's it's fun and you want to be, you want to meet the people that work here and be involved with them, mm-hmm. that it starts creating a vibe. It's what I've always tried to do, is just take the physical stuff and turn it into a relationship make a lot of friends, get like-minded people together, stuff starts happening. I mean, that's what you've always done yeah. at all of the other restaurants. Yeah. Just quickly, tell me who you brought in the head of culinary. Yeah, I, so you have funny, something I, got, I was very fortunate. Um, I actually know her brother very well, and we got connected through a brother who used to work for me. Okay. Uh, but Kene is that good, Chef Kene is that good. Uh, who has on her resume uh, the French Laundry, uh, Addison in San Diego, um, kinship and metier mm-hmm. uh, is I hired as the chef here, and she's absolutely amazing. And we're having just a blast. And she only started a couple months ago, so we're we're just trying to elevate every part of this physical situation into something that becomes more emotional and passionate. That makes sense. Okay, before we wrap up with you, um, I know you guys are doing a vet. So even though it's this members only. Club, you do have events that are for the public. Why do that? Yeah, so it's not 100% uh, private. We do put out events. Uh, one, of the, one of the things we do that's so great here is, and, and you can't always do this at a restaurant because you're doing like so many covers every night, right. is that we can have a lot of, we have filled the calendar with custom events led by subject matter experts that we curate, mm. right? Some internal, some external. And then putting those out there to the public, say half, half for members and half for public, uh, gets eyes on and gets some gets some interest going, and that's what I figured might be a, might be fun. So, so I, know, like I know you have an event on the fifteenth. Do you know what it is? Yeah, we have we have. We have um, so I introduced a, a bourbon. Oh, nineteen, nineteen. Yeah. So uh, Chaz Lum, who's an exec- executive bourbon store and a very good friend of mine, mm-hmm. and a fellow barrel picker. I'm very into bourbon as well. Food. I mean, like all uh, chefs. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Tell me something I don't know. Yeah, right. okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, trying to trying to make some really cool experiences with uh, with Burba, with Chaz. He's hosting three events. This is the second one. Okay, cool. And we're going to actually do our own blending class. Um, oh, and then we fun. have multiple wine dinners coming up, um, and wine classes mm-hmm. and spirit classes, and we'll get into gins and tequilas and anything. It's really a um, I like to use the word that we know incubator. Right. That's what I want wine life to be is an incubator for people who are interested at all different levels mm-hmm. and all different experiences around food, wine, and spirits. I love it. All right, great. John Crin, thank you for uh, starting this partnership with me. I'm very excited. It's an honor to be with you. Yeah. Oh, very great. Okay, I'm going to kick you out of that chair because I'm going to bring in Sarah Mayo. <laughs> so a couple of weeks ago on my show, Booty and the Beast, Sarah Mayo came in studio with her caviar, and her caviar is from Uruguay. And even though she and I had talked on the phone and she gave me her elevator pitch, I was like, sure, come in studio. I was really blown away by her just total breadth and depth of knowledge when it came to caviar. She's also like from the wine biz. She's been in the hospitality industry for a very long time. Um, And uh, I don't know. I was like, why don't we taste some caviar together? (laughs) So um, Sarah Mayo, thank you so much for joining me. Um, Sarah is with Black River Caviar. Um, So let's give people your 411 first. Well, for one on the wine where I started and how yeah, I just a little bit. Okay, okay. Well, you know. 
We're yeah, we only have a half hour. Okay. Okay. Tini and I worked in, in the wine industry for a long time, was mm -hmm. the editor, editor of the Wine Advocate, for example. Right. And uh, sold representative of Australian wines. And then I am a, I live on Cape Cod part of the time, and I'm a mad oyster. And my oyster partner, one day I was out digging for oysters in Barnstable Harbor, mm -hmm. and she said, hey, you know, my cousin just bought a farm, a caviar farm in Uruguay, and they're looking for somebody to run global head of sales, and I told him it'd be perfect. And that's how I ended up in caviar. Okay, that's amazing. <laughs> it was going to be, be more direct. Okay, but I want to know, like, let's talk caviar. I think the lay person thinks, we know that there's American caviar. Right. Um, there's sort of good news, bad news about it. And then, but people think caviar has to be from Russia, right? Well, I mean, that's the myth. So can we talk through the history a little bit? Absolutely. Great. So in effect, I mean, that really is Russia's kind of like, you know, golden crown of a product and everybody knows that all the caviar came from the Caspian Sea, which borders Russia and Iran right. and Azerbaijan. So there's other countries, but Russia definitely is um, most well known. And it's, branded as Russian Ocetra, and it's a species of sturgeon called Vasapensa golden Sadi, which is Russian. That's so easy for you to I know, say. it really is. I'm not even going to try no, saying no. it. That's the first thing I did is learn how to say that. Good job. <laughs> okay. But basically, that's where it all started. There's also the Iranians, uh, they farm, or they actually produce um, a very similar species, kind of a cousin to Vasapensa golden Sadi, but they're all Caspian, Ponto-Caspian varieties. Russian oh, wait, Ponto-Caspian... It's just, it's just the species, but is that like specific to the region? It's the Caspian species. Okay. So there's four of them. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of an important thing to know, and I can tell you about the surgeon then later. But in any event, all of these, I mean, Russia basically was the leader in, in producing caviar and became, it became part of the Russian diet. And, you know, you can read through all sorts of websites and how it was served to kings and czars and everybody in the world mm -hmm. um, who had money. Um, it also, through the communist era, became something that was a little bit more accessible to normal people, given the kind of communist ideology. Right. But as a result of that, there led to a lot of overfishing in the Caspian, so depletion of stocks. There also, this is why we can't have nice things. That's yeah, right. A little bit, and mm -hmm. then the other part of it is, you know, progress dammed up the basically the Volga where the spawning happens. Because what surgeon nobody thinks they're all you know saltwater fish, and the Caspian is kind of a low salinity saltwater body, but they have a migratory pattern. They spawn upriver, mm -hmm. and so what happened in the case of the Ponta Caspian sturgeon is a lot of the river tributaries have been dammed up, and there's industry with pollution, etc., and it's interrupted the creation or basically the spawning ha habitats. So that's led to a decline. In the 50s, this kind of came to a head. And so the Russians more or less, um, and even around the 50s, they more or less came up with a way to farm caviar. Okay. And, and you know, it's not the easiest fish in the world to farm. They're kind of... Uh, well, they're big, right? They're big fish. Um, like, how big do they get? Oh, they can get immense. I mean, belugas get to be, you know, as big as this room. I mean, okay, they can be they're like big. That's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. That's the top of the food chain is beluga, so huso huso. And then next up is aspensu globustadi. And, and those can actually get to, I mean, our fish are harvested at about 60 pounds, something like that. Okay. Um, but they can get up to, you know, they can get a lot bigger. They mm -hmm. can get up to 150 pounds or so and live a long time. Okay. Um, but again, in a farmed environment, you know, they spawn at about seven to nine years. So that's when you would, you know, harvest them for the caviar mm -hmm. and then use the fish meat to, you know, that eat. in Russia they eat it. A lot. But in any event, the Russians came up with this farmed industry and they really dominated it. And so it was really the crown jewel of the Russian export and also the marked currency during the Soviet era, if you think about it. Um, so everything was ticking along just fine. Because of the depletion in the Caspian Sea, there was concern that the, the species were threatened and they were going to become endangered. Sure. So eventually they became listed and as threatened and are part of the, the Convention on the International Trade of Endangered Species, so CITES Convention. Mm. And all caviar now is, is monitored. So all of our shipments that we bring up has down to the gram, how much is there, we have to report it with CITES, where it's moving, where it's going. So consumers... So, that, that, so it's a global thing. It's absolutely. not just... Russia or Persia, you know, or uh, Iran or wherever. So it's not like that. Most everybody 
is a signatory to it. So yes, okay. not everybody, but most everybody. Mm -hmm. And so the United States is for sure. And so that's one of the things now, it's very tightly regulated. But as a result of this depletion in natural wild stocks and the advent of not knowing how to farm caviar, farm sturgeon, right. the industry blew up. And this really happened kind of mid mid 1990s is when the But that's what it wasn't just for caviar. I mean the fish farming industry sort of took off like in the 90s, right? It was all over, like in Iceland and everywhere. Everybody was trying to figure out how to make it. Yeah, sustain sustainability became the marketing term. Absolutely. But everybody was trying to figure it out because for financial reasons. Absolutely. Right. And, and so sturgeon was no different. Right. Um, I will say, just so you know, growing up, I'm Jewish. We had smoked fish mm. every Sunday. Mm. Smoked sturgeon. It's so delicious. Yes. Oh, and, you can't, and you can't find it anywhere. Well, I'll be sending you oh some because it's better. part of my gift packs and I do we do <laughs> a holiday offering. Anyway. Excuse me while I get more comfortable as we talk about sturgeon and caviar. Okay, go ahead. So as the farmed industry group, Black River would have been one of the early farms to set up. So uh -huh. in the kind of the mid-1990s, and we had a really interesting origin story in that the 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 family or the man who set up the, the farm, Walter Alcalde, he had a provisioning business out of Montevideo in Uruguay. And he happened to know a lot of people from the Russian fleet because he was provisioning the Russian Soviet fleet. Okay. He got to know the people in the industry, uh, or in the industry, excuse me, at the embassy. And so, you know, glass moss came, things went a little bit pear-shaped for the Soviet Union, and he had become really good friends with one of the guys who worked at the embassy. And this guy came to him and said, hey, Walter, you know, as it turns out, we've done a whole lot of like opposition research on where the best place to farm Russian uh, sturgeon, Russian Osiatra, this aspens of Golden Stadium. Mm -hmm. We have satellite imagery, water quality studies, soil samples, all this stuff. And you know, guess what? The best place to do it is the Rio Negro in Uruguay. <laughs> and Walter said, well, how about that? Let's start a farm. And so with a lot of assistance from Russian people mm -hmm. to include bringing over the original broodstock, setting up our farm system, mm -hmm. coming up with the whole plan and how to basically to sustainably farm. We had some help. It got all started in the mid 1990s. It became commercial because obviously the tadpoles have to actually grow into fish sure. and mature. So in the early 2000s, that's when Black River basically came to market. Mm -hmm. um, but can we talk about um, farming a little bit? Because you know, probably in the early aughts, Fish farming got a really dirty name because mm -hmm. there were so many people doing it so poorly. Mm -hmm. So can we talk about how you guys are doing it, that it is legit sustainable right. um, and that it's good to the fish right. because, you know, I, I think it was um, tilapia and they, just, they, they just had yeah. fish in pools and they were eating their own poop and I mean, it was just gross. Yeah, I mean, it, I, and it's not like that anymore. You can eat tilapia. Exactly, it's changed. Exactly. But. And I think the FDA and other people deregulate some of that yeah. stuff. But I mean, the big distinction between what we do and what most every other aquaculture program for sturgeon and caviar does mm -hmm. is we, we, there's a, you know, aquaculture is done in a RAS system, a recirculated water system. So they have these big basins and, you know, the water's being filtered and whatnot and re-put into, and so the fish are swimming around. And in the case of sturgeon, it's seven to nine years. And so they're in there a long time, mm -hmm. just to be clear. Right. So that's how most caviars made and done. And, and they have to when it's raised in this type of environment because of, you know, you are what you eat and everything else, and right. you, which is the water you swim in. Often these fish have to have, go through a process before they're harvested of purging to basically put them in clean water to try and, and you know, like detoxify them. I don't know if it detoxifies so much because I don't know that system, so I'm not going right. to get into that. But that was something you know because you you're hope what you're told is on the plate is on the plate. Yeah. So let's talk about traceability and what it means for you all. Well, for us, it's it's actually very good because <laughs> we manage the full life cycle of the fish, mm -hmm. and so. The process for us is, you know, we do the reproduction and, and it's more or less, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's like any kind of animal husbandry, I think. It's the, we get the girl's eggs and this is done by a C-section, the unfertilized eggs. Mm -hmm. And then we get sperm from the male fish and then it's, I always joke around, you put it in the, the you know, the beaker and swirl it around. Mm -hmm. It's like sea monkeys, you know, right. stuff pops out. But then we actually have this whole, um, 
it's what they call a criadera, and it's just this it imitates a babbling brook because that's where the spawning environment would be. Okay. So they all spawn, they come in little tadpoles. We keep them in, in, in a closed environment and tanks until they get to be about a year, year and a half old because they've been large enough to be moved out into these enclosures out in the lake. Okay. And there they just grow and they take on weight. When they're moved out into the enclosures, they're still kind of anonymous, if you will. At about two and a half years, we go out and we sex them. And so they're able to determine here's male, here's female. Okay. So the males, they get harvested and you know sold for meat sure. pretty well immediately. And then the girls at that point, they get a little microchip, you know, like a nose ring <laughs> put in their nose. Oh my God. Yeah, so it's a little microchip because throughout their life, you know, they need to come by and monitor and take a nose reading and say, okay, this is this fish, this class, this, that, if, you know, if there's any problem with it or when they're moving around okay. to identify. So they get a little so bit. how many fish are you identifying? That sounds like an, an insane process. It, well, you know, we, our, our harvest, I mean, our reproduction this year yielded, you know, over 200,000 fish. I mean, that's so, what I'm thinking. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, but there's, there's a mortality rate too, you know, sure. the, so the, the natural mortality rate. And so you, by the time they get moved out to the enclosures, we've got lots of enclosures and you sure. don't have too many fish in any one enclosure, mm -hmm. but then you're, half of the population is going to get winnowed down at two and a half years because okay. it's going to be men. Right. So okay. that goes away, and then you just have the girls, and then they get moved at that point with their, you know, new nose ring. And they get moved into the basins, and they're really looked after as a class. It's a, a year class of fish, and so we know at about, and they just at that point they're just fed and they're swimming and they're just kind of hanging out in the basins, and right. that's what they did. They just swim, and then when it comes into the period when they're going to start spawning, that's when you know. They do a reading and we start doing ultrasounds to make sure, see if they're developing the okay. the, the row. And then after we find out, yes, okay, these are. So the you're doing like a massive ultrasound, like over the whole thing. Is it each fish? How does each, it happen? Each, each fish you have to do. I mean, it's, that's why you know people talk about caviar so expensive. It's like, I mean, there's a reason. Very, well, it's a very hands-on. And also seven to nine years. Of right. No, it's investment. It's well, it's. I hear you. There's a lot of care and feeding into the girls. Mm -hmm. So. All that happens, and then when it comes time to say, okay, this this group, this this number of females, these tag, they're ready to go. Mm -hmm. Right before then, we do a biopsy, and they more or less will take a needle and take out a sample of ten eggs. Okay. They take those ten eggs and they put them in a beaker, and then they put them in a microscope, and you see on the computer screen, and they measure literally like like a graph the size, the size, and if it's two point nine five millimeters or greater, we harvest. If it's less than that. They live to swim another day. Okay. Now, they, they also don't necessarily respawn the next year. It could be two years. I mean, you know, it, right. you don't know. And so at that point, they get kind of put in a wild card pool of people but <laughs> or fish, but they still have their little nose ring. So point being, we manage it that way. The girls that are identified for harvest, then they're taken in turn. Mm -hmm. and, and really, it's done on a weekly rolling basis. We harvest southern hemisphere from march until september interesting um northern hemisphere is the opposite so sure. they're all harvesting right now and so that's when our harvest cycle is well and i think that's also really interesting i don't know if people think of caviar people think of caviar when they want caviar mm. they don't think of caviar as really seasonal right well it, it's it's like anything i mean there's a it, it's spring you know they're coming into or you know excuse me the fall is when it right down, down there right down there and so it's coming into Fall and, mm -hmm. and that's when the water's getting cooler and they're getting frisky and they swim up river and they right. you know, it's just the natural order of things. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's that's when it is the season for us. Interestingly though, and having now tasted caviar raw right out of the belly, you know, right. and before it's been salted and everything else, and then tasting Wait, the caviar water, is salted? That's how you cure it. That's all it is. It's just cat it's just eggs and salt. I have no idea. Okay. That's, that's I feel like an idiot is. now. Okay, go I'll ahead. Tell you We're gonna cut that. Yeah, go ahead. No, I'll tell you, I'll tell you it's made. So okay, tell me. In fact, we take, you know, the process after they harvest, they take out the the, the egg sack. I like how you keep like cutting into the air when they harvest. When they but go harvest. ahead. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Um, anyway, when they harvest, we'll take out the egg sack. And then they obviously they weigh it because weight's how we're doing everything. We have to report it. 
And then they more or less, there's a screen and a little bowl underneath it. And they put the, the egg, and it's quite hard, the, the roe, at this point, because you think the caviar is super delicate. Oh, yeah. But it's super the, delicate. Yeah, but at the beginning, it's it's like a little, little bean shop. I mean, it's actually quite hard. Interesting. And I, I didn't expect that myself. Okay. Um, not bean shop, it's not that hard. What's it called? Like, What's, oh, God, well, I can't think of the name. I was just in Italy. Uh, the Vitarga. Vitarga. Yeah. That would be super soft. It's turned into, you know, paste. Yeah, right? paste, yeah. right. Okay. But in any event, you take that and you put it through a screen to remove the membrane off of it, and then they take it out and they rinse it with water, mm -hmm. uh, mineral water, and then at that point, after it's rinsed and drained, then they more or less measure by weight. They'll measure the, the you know, they've already got the weight of the caviar. Right. And then they'll do a measure by weight to get the percentage of salt. And they add the salt and mix it around for a period of time, and mm -hmm. then allow it to drain a little bit because it'll macerate, it'll leach out a little bit of water instantly. Sure. And then they put it into what are called these really large blue original tins. I said they used to be metal. We use plastic blue ones. There's one manufacturer from Italy that makes the world's talk about a corner on the market. Okay. And they're not cheap. I bet. It's like oak barrel. Oh, I was going to say, it's like a barrel. It's right. oak barrel. But there's no char on this, no, right? No, no, no. Okay. No, no, no. There's a rubber band around it. Okay. It's got a little breathe a little bit. But so then they just more or less pack the, the caviar into that, put the lid on, and we put it immediately into uh, into the, the refrigerator, which is, we store ours at negative two degrees Celsius, so okay. just under freezing. Yeah. All the salt, it doesn't, like salt water, it doesn't freeze. It uh -huh. actually just, you know. Kind of hangs out. Kind of hangs out and macerates. And like cheese, we'll go in and turn the, the the um the the huh. teas over so that the the liquid is moving up and down and through mm -hmm. so it's evenly curing, and we in our case we don't ship any fresh caviar for at least a month. Okay, and we like to do two months, six weeks, two months. At well, least. so when you move it from that container and you put it into tins, well, tins. okay, so right. that's step two. Yeah, okay, so let's get to step two because I think a lot of people don't know. Like how long, if I buy a tin of caviar, how long does it last? Like, does the curing process keep it, process, excuse me, keep it for a certain amount of time? Like, how does it, how does it all work? And does every time it touch oxygen, does it degrade greatly? Like, and this is really, that. this is really important for the people in the industry, though, know, because I don't know that a lot of people know how to store and keep caviar. I mean, I certainly didn't know until I started working on mm -hmm. this job, but... So from the OT, we give it a year. If okay. it's kept at this negative, it'll, it'll more or less age for a year. Mm -hmm. um, once you, and we sell the OTs to other brands as bulk. So there is some of our caviar that's branded under other caviar. Okay. Not many, but a few. Okay. But when we repack it into the smaller tins for our own brand, you more or less, the larger tins, it's a little bit like, very much like the wine industry, you know, magnums age more slowly than 375 mils. Sure. So the bigger tins, 100, 100 grams and bigger, you know, we give those six months. If they're kept at the right temperature, mm -hmm. they'll be fine. And keeping it at the right temperature, like as close to 32 degrees is really important because it just keeps everything all toned, you know, and then, you know, it's right at the right. So, but I'm thinking as a home buyer, I can't help but I'm thinking of myself. Well, if I buy caviar and I put it in my fridge. You, I would advise you, and I do on the back of this little brochure that I right. send with every shipment, um, put it in a bowl, preferably a metal bowl because it stays nice. Oh, and right, nice and cold. Like, oh, it doesn't matter, but I put it in a metal bowl. And then the ice packs that we ship it with, rotate those and keep an ice pack on top of so it. So that it stays colder. So this just stays a little bit colder because your rabbit fridge is going to be 37 to 40 degrees, something mm -hmm. like that. Right. And so that just brings it down a little closer to 32. Okay. And, and that just helps, I think. that That's my advice to everybody is coldest you can keep it and also in the coldest part of your fridge, maybe in the back where everything with the eggs freeze. Yeah, perfect. right, and that's right. Like where my spot. watermelon freezes, exactly. my watermelon always that's freezes. That's the perfect spot. Okay, so let me ask you a question. First of all, we have to taste some. Okay, of course. I, I definitely want to do that. And now you guys have several varieties. We do. What are the varieties? So the grading system is, it's, and this is something every brand is It's like a little have. tiny, itty bitty. I can't even just this one. I'm, I'm going to get a lot of grief. I'm no, sending no. the bigger ones after. <laughs> so the, uh, ones. The, the grading is really up to the brand. Mm -hmm. But in our case, we more or less, the harvest yields pretty distinctly three types of caviar mm -hmm. in addition to some 
special things that I've now teased off to have this special lots. Okay. But what we end up with is that 2.95 millimeter small step. Mm -hmm. That gets graded as our entry or first level grade tradition. Okay. Yeah. So it's got a black tab. And generally speaking, it's going to be the smallest. Sure. And, and now on flavor, I think it's still buttery, creamy, and all that. I think it's a little more direct is the way I would describe the flavor. Interesting. Okay. okay. The next grade up has a wider band, and this is of size, and this is where um, the bulk of our caviar, like 65%, is going to fall into what we grade as Royale. Okay. And it's going to be 2.96, so a little bit bigger, up to 3.04, mm -hmm. roughly. So it's going to have almost a whole millimeter okay. of size. <laughs> and we also, it can maybe range from dark to dark white brown. It can have a little bit of color variation. So I'm not going to tell you my royal is always going to be this color. Sure. Because it's not. Yeah, because sometimes you'll see caviar that is almost bordering on gray. You can mixed in, believe right? it. And also we do get some gray caviar. And mm -hmm. so that's what I will tease off. And I'll make it a special lot because it looks a lot like beluga. And I sometimes get this beautiful amber caviar that looks like your hair. It's super blonde and pretty. And you know, yeah, and you just have amber. And it's just that, but that's something different. We have a master select, which is really large red, like 3.3 well, 3 .3 or greater, mm. and really golden, like, you know, amber. And that's our, we only get maybe three kilos or four kilos a year out of that. It's just one or two fish. We have another Imperial Reserve that's really large red, 3.25. And the dark, like really like black beauty. Mm -hmm. and so it's, you know, you've got all these different kinds of things, but tradition's going to be 2.95, Royale's mm -hmm. going to be that middle, and then what we're going to taste yes. is called Imperial. Let's taste now, it. Now what I do with my Imperial? There we go. Imperial, and it is basically the lightest that we have okay. uh, that we get a quantity of. So it's mm -hmm. going to be, you'll see, it's a lot lighter. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, so it's really pretty, huh? Yes. Yeah. You taste with me, yeah? Yes, I will, of course. Although I'm saying so, I'm going to have the tiniest taste and okay. I'm going to be able to try. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah. I mean, it's so yummy. It's so good. <laughs> and it's the, the, the thing that's really amazing, I mean, and when, I, when they asked me if I wanted this job, the first thing they did I would have been like, yes. I would have known. They sent me the tents. They sent me and they go, right. okay, here's what we sell. And I tasted the tradition. I go, oh, that's really good. Right. And then I tasted the royal. I go, Oh wow, that's really good. Mm -hmm. And then I got to this, and I'm like, oh, I maybe it's my other side of spin. You, you're having the rest of it, so go for it. Okay. Um, I just said I can definitely. Everybody's mm. gonna love that because it's so clean. And and I tasted, and you will too. You'll taste this for days. It just has such a really nice length. Well, you know, sometimes so I think um, caviar are a lot like truffles. Mm. You know, there's sort of like the hoopla about caviar, caviar, caviar. Mm -hmm. You really don't know what you're getting. Do you know what I mean? Same thing with truffles. Like, you know, I can't tell you how many times <laughs> I mean, mean, you know, somebody's shaving the truffles on top, and I can tell that it's not the they're not fresh. Yeah. So that there's either truffle oil or something like that to replicate the smell, yeah. which is unfortunate. Um, but this has such a it has such a distinct taste and flavor and texture, yeah. which I think is really important because yeah. a lot of times you'll get caviar that it can be mushy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like you talked about yeah. earlier. So now, and that would be temperature. A lot of it, you're right, it's probably if temperature. You, if you buy it and you leave it in your fridge, I've had people go, oh, I've had this for two months and I'm just like, you know, it's it's not good. I mean, you really, when you get it from wherever you're buying it, right. probably just me, right. um, you, you know, it's Get it when you want to have it soon. Don't mm -hmm. don't don't collect it. Caviar is not for collecting; it's for consuming. Yeah. Okay, well, so let's talk about. That's a smart thing to say. Yeah. It's not wine. No, it does not get better with age. No, right? When you buy no, it's it, like right. it's always better. It's a nouveau. Yeah. Get it. Get it. Drink it. Do it. It's almost yeah. Beaujolais nouveau season anyway. Exactly. Um, okay, so now is this just for restaurants? Is this for everybody? Tell us a little bit about the business model, and if people are interested in either a learning more because we're a fountain of information, mm -hmm. but also um, accessing it, of how course. they go about doing it. So we do sell direct to restaurants, and this is all farm direct, so we pack them up and we, everybody gets farm direct. Right. And then we also sell direct to consumer on the website. So you visit blackrivercaviar.com and mm -hmm. you can order online. So that's it's how so easy. It's, it's very easy to do. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of 
the bigger business, so we do four ton of caviar. Well, this year it's about four ton. Last year it was five. So, so when you say four ton, it makes my head explode just a little bit because this little tin is so tiny. It's 20 grams. And so there's there's 50 of those in a kilo, and okay. four tons is 4,000 of those kilos. So gotcha. Just, you know, that's a lot of caviar. Yes. And so tiny tins and big tins, the big, right. the big OTs that I sell to other brands, there is a bulk side to our business as well. So sure. I have selected enough, and we really are, at this point, we only sell to a few people because we can sell it. I mean, they, we have no problem selling it. So it's just, you know, we're picking our customers in that sense. Mm -hmm. And working with people who also understand the value, who aren't going to, you know, just discount it or mistreat it. Because sure. It has on the back that traceability. It says it's on the. They would say it comes from our our farms. Right. We want our farm to always be represented well. So, uh, but it's bulk for the you know some brands, but then I sell direct to restaurants and mm -hmm. to you know consumers. Anybody we do events, all that sort of thing. Okay, so of course, if you do events, especially in the DC market, you'll send me the info. So I can put it on the list. Of course, of course. And because um, I know you're going to be at Cheese Teak in a couple of weeks, right? Giving yeah. tastings, they have that wine around, which is, I'm going to actually be there, which is going to be which great. great. Yes. Um, but tell me um, where we can find you online or on Instagram so people can look you up. We're very kind of straightforward. It's Black River Caviar. <laughs> so hashtag Black River Caviar. Cool. BlackRiverCaviar.com. Great. Um, you can also do VR caviar, which is what my business card says, but Black River Caviar is how you find us. Sarah Mayer, Black River Caviar. Thank, thank you, you so much so for much. joining me. And I want to thank the team at Mine Lair for um, keeping my teapot full <laughs> all day because I do main mine uh, tea during the day and then wine at night. That's like sort of how I like to do it. And now caviar. I mean, I can't sure. think of a worse way to do this. Um, so I want to thank the team at Wine Lair for hosting us for our very first podcast here, Industry Night at Wine Lair. And I want to thank you all for joining me. I do want to remind you to follow me at NYCCI, N-E-L-L. -L. IS on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, where I talk about all of my adventures. I just got back from two weeks in Sardinia, and uh, I'm going to St. Martin because I'm bragging now about all the places I'm going, but I do eat and drink pretty well all around the uh, Eastern Seaboard, so follow me there for that. Of course, you want to tune in every Sunday uh, for Foodie and the Beast with my husband, David. We just Cinched 14 years on air. That's on 1500 AM. Or you can go to the list or you want it.com and click on the link to everything to hear all the things I'm doing and check out the calendar and the buzz column for all the things you should be doing too. And if you want to know about those restaurants and when they're opening, it's all in the coming soon and openings page. So again, I want to thank Wine Lair, John Crin for hosting me today. I want to thank uh, Miss Mayo for joining me in studio and bringing in delicious caviar. And uh, just a little housekeeping note for all you people out there. As I say every week, staffing shortages are real. It's real out there. And everybody's doing the best that they can to serve you. I know you're coming in and spending money. I know it's a little more expensive. But do know that no restaurant, no server wants you to have a bad time. Because at the end of the day, that's bad business. So take your kindness pills, take a deep breath, and have a delicious week. Mm -hmm.